Hey, this is Greg Elwood, editor-in-chief of HitFix.com, and I'm here with Ben Kotner and Ryan White, the directors of The Case uh, Against Eight, a documentary that premiered at the 2014 Sundance Film Festival this past weekend. And um, Ben and Ryan, I wanted to ask you guys, what was your reaction uh, to the audience seeing the film for the first time after working on this yourselves for five years? Well, we were completely overwhelmed, and I mean, I think we were tingling all over just because we were there with uh, with so many people who had been with us on the film for so long, and to see it for the first time with uh, with an audience uh, that didn't necessarily know a lot about the case, and the fact that the emotional response was so overwhelming, I think it just uh, it, it took us by by surprise, and uh, it was really a thrill. Been a huge sigh of relief. I think we were terrified going into the premiere. So finally, when the credits were rolling and we had a standing ovation, and our, everyone who was in the film seemed happy with it, it was finally like Sundance became fun at that moment. But leading up to it, it was not fun. Had you purposely not shown it to like friends and family just to sort of get a reaction before you did that, or were you just hey, listen, until I show it at a public place, I'll never know what people will say? I think it was really that we that we tried not to show it to friends and family. We were just making the film so quickly that there was never really the time to be getting a lot of opinions on it. I mean, we shot the film for four years, but we only edited it for nine months, which is a really short period of time for a film that spans five years and has 600 hours of footage. So it was just a very quick pace. And so we had maybe the most we ever had watched the film with was five or six people. So, so to be in there with 320 people or whatever it was and, and actually feel the emotions in a way that we had never done with a group of people or hear laughter at parts of our film that we thought were funny, but we didn't realize 320 other people would find funny was really, really cool. You guys actually came on board with the legal team. How did that happen? What was your connection? How did you get into them? So our film picks up after the passage of Prop 8 when a federal lawsuit was filed uh, challenging the constitutionality of it. And we had found out about that and we approached the organization, American Foundation for Equal Rights, which was the organization that was sponsoring it. And we had some early conversations with them about, you know, there was a possibility that this could become a historic case. Nobody was sure. Uh, but we thought, hey, let's start filming and if, and if it turns turns into that, we'll, we'll have a record of it. Uh, and so time went by and the case snowballed into one of the biggest civil rights cases in history. So we were really honored to be there to witness uh, that piece of history. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I, said it <coughs> I mean, it, access, was, access was key to this film. If we didn't have the access, then there was no film there. Um, and one other sort of curveball that's part of the, the narrative of the film is that the, the case was supposed to be televised. So when the case went to trial, the judge wanted it to be broadcast to the American people, and the other side appealed that, and they made it to the U.S. Supreme Court, and the U.S. Supreme Court blocked that broadcast right. just on the eve of trial. And so at that moment, Ben and I were making a movie regardless about this case, and we already had the access to the lawyers, but at that moment, our access became much more important because we felt then the motivation and the, and the burden in some ways that our film now was the only document of what went into this trial. And so if we hadn't been given that access by Ted and David and, and also the four plaintiffs into the human side of things, I think our film wouldn't, wouldn't have gotten as far as it did. Well, you shot this for what, four years then or five years? Five years. Five years. There must have been moments where you guys were like, especially in the downtimes in between, like, well, maybe we should expand it. Maybe we should, you know, follow other stories or other things. How hard was it to just stay focused just on this one story? Really, there were so many characters involved in this case and so many twists and turns, and we had to keep a very small crew. It was Ryan, myself, mm -hmm. and uh, and Rebecca was our, our third camera person. And because of the confidentiality of that, we had to keep it small with no sound people, no cinematographers with us. So for us to follow such a complicated case with so many twists and turns and so many characters, I think it really would have been impossible for us to expand it to other cases. Uh, and we knew it was so huge. I mean, we knew how many hours of footage we were logging and how many great characters we have that we, we knew it was gonna be hard to make a reasonable length film of the type of footage that we were getting yeah. so the idea of other gay marriage cases and yeah. you know yeah. the, the social issue which Ben and I were never really interested in doing a, a movie about whether gay marriage was right or wrong right. and interviewing people yeah. that that had opinions on, on you know religious opinions or things like that our film was a character film about these people and we knew from like or I knew I think from like day one or day two these are really compelling characters and this is going to be a character film that will keep an audience compelled hopefully well I have to say you were sort of lucky in one respect because you were shooting two other docs at the same time correct yes. and you had a full-time job did that make it easier to say as patient as you needed to do in a process like this 
Well, it, 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 it at least allowed us to be employed while we were making a <laughs> five-year documentary. Well, you were employed. I was making other documentaries. <laughs> we <were making> other <laughs> so, uh, so it allowed us to do that. I mean, it certainly presented a lot of challenges mm -hmm. in terms of time. I think that's one of the, you know, we were really happy that we were directing this together. Sometimes yeah. we could pick up the slack from each other when we were busy with other things. Um, but the timing, we lucked out re a lot on the timing of the case, falling at times that worked out for both of us. Um, yeah, but it, it is. is a test of your patience. I mean, you, you don't want to, as a documentary director, you don't want to wait five or six years to put out a film that you're investing everything into. And so you, you fill in the gaps. And, you know, there were major gaps in this. You know, after the trial, it was, it was years that the, that the case ping-ponged around the court system where we would be doing nothing for, for five or six months and then get a phone call saying you have to fly to D.C. or San Francisco to do this. So the long gaps also allowed us to sort of go back to our normal life or work on other projects. But it was, I would say, a test of patience. And, and you brought this up before. So the, the case happens last June. Uh, you know, uh, gay marriage is now allowed. You, you guys got that amazing footage you know, at the end of the movie. And then you have, what, nine months, six months, seven months to, to edit the film uh, to try to make Sundance. And you know, first of all, you brought in a, a really well-known editor to come on board to, to edit the film. I forgot her name. It's Kate Amen. Kate Amen. And um, to have worked on something for five years or four years, you know, and you guys must have done some edits. How hard was it to take your baby and, and let someone else come in and just sort of like? I, I always say that the f we handed Kate one scene at the very beginning, a scene that we thought was integral to the film. And we gave her the footage and we gave her the interview bites that we thought were relevant. This was like the first week that we hired her. And she came back to us and showed us this six minute piece that she edited and Ben and I were floored. We were like, we made the right decision. <laughs> so that was actually the first time I've worked, I, I've, I've hired someone that, that completely takes over. You know, my other, one, my first film I edited and then my second film I edited very closely with the editor basically at the desk with her. And she, we actually brought her on board to this film as well. Her name's Helen Kern, she was the associate editor and she's really talented too. But this was the first time where it was like, like handing a lot over to the editor and giving her a lot of uh, agency. And, and it was really helpful, I think, for us, because like Ben said, we shot it all ourselves, too. So yeah. we were really insiders on it and sometimes had trouble having an objective eye. And so Kate really functioned as that for us. So we had the, I mean, the best working relationship with Kate. I think she was huge in, 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 the, uh, in the final product. And also, you know, uh, composers for uh, score for docs never get enough credit. They never, you never hear about them, or probably money. But can you? I, I didn't recognize the name of the guy who did this. Can you talk about that? Because I thought this was gorgeous. Yeah. And yeah. and how did you find him? And and should I know who he is? Has he done other stuff yeah. before? Yeah, I mean, Blake Neely is our composer, yeah. and he he's done a lot of amazing stuff. He does a lot of television stuff. Mm. He's done a couple of movies, uh, and he uh, he came onto this because he reached out to us because he was passionate about. The issue and he wanted to be involved and at the time we had no idea that he was a really successful composer and, <laughs> and we well, kind of we kind of ignored the email for a couple of months. Why is this months. desperate, is this desperate we, composer emailing and us? And then we yeah. went back and looked and saw that this is this guy's insanely talented and mm. he uh, he composed something that's so incredibly beautiful and was really one of the most fun parts of making this film mm -hmm. was working with him and and uh, and watching him create the score and being there while it was um, recorded with a 24-piece orchestra they are friends now we followed them for five years so it's just i would say the hardest scene to film was chris i was with chris and sandy at their wedding and ben was with mm -hmm. paul and jeff that was the hardest scene to film because i did not want to be behind a camera and i love being behind the camera but i just wanted to be sharing in the moment with them mm -hmm. they're they're like moms to us um, and so my, my takeaway is just four really great friends and I'm excited to see where their lives go. We've watched them be completely tunneled into this for the last five years and it's sort of eaten up all of their, all of their life outside of their family and work life. And so I'm excited to see where their lives go now and, and they're married. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I just say it's just such a privilege to make a film about people that inspire you so much. And, and that's such a rewarding process. Well, guys, thanks so much. Congratulations. And uh, The Case Against Eight uh, should be on HBO in June, correct? So uh, it, will it be in theaters before or just be? Mini-qualifying. Mini-qualifying. Right. Yeah. So uh, you'll get a chance to see this uh, on HBO in June and check it out. It is quite amazing. For breaking entertainment news and more, follow at HitFix on Twitter or visit HitFix.com.